It's the Daily Dog. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Daily Dog. Thanks for being with me today for what is going to be our Behind the Score series, episode number 33. And uh, I'm coming to you from uh, the middle of December of 2022. And the song that I have picked today to dive into with a, a score is Life on Mars by David Bowie. I recently included this song in our fan favorites series on the Patreon here. Uh, it was uh, the, the last you know big fan favorites of the year. It came out uh, the beginning of this month, beginning of December. And Life on Mars was suggested on Discord. It got a lot of upvotes. It made it to the Patreon poll, and it got in uh, the video. And, of course, I have heard this song before uh, diving into it for more of a reaction uh, for the fan favorites. But I was really struck, y'all, by the immense backstory to this song that I really had no idea existed. And it's been stuck in my head for the last few weeks. And as I went to think about doing this behind the score, I'm like, I gotta do more on Life on Mars. What is it that makes it tick? And especially uh, when we consider that it is a companion piece or it has some history with My Way by Frank Sinatra. And I wanted to see how close these two songs actually are in their harmonies and in their melodies. And uh, I wanted just to do a deeper dive on it. So that's what we're doing today, friends. Um, the song itself, Life on Mars, is brilliant. It's considered one of David Bowie's, um, you know, like crowning achievements of his career. And it's, it's a beautiful tune and it's really sophisticated and, and quite beautiful. And uh, when you consider all of the, the, the backstory behind this, it makes it even more interesting, uh, which is always the case. Whenever I find more information about a composer or a piece of music and its backstory or the circumstances under which it was created, it always makes it more interesting to me. So uh, this song, uh, Life on Mars, was from uh, David Bowie's fourth album called Hunky Dory that was released in late 1971. But the story of this happens uh, or starts much sooner. Uh, several years earlier, David was working as primarily a lyricist and the publishing company that he was working for had an option available to them on this French song that had been uh, a hit in France. And uh, they wanted an option for an English version of the lyrics. And so David uh, did uh, a version of those lyrics. He has said himself that he's not too keen on it. And uh, they passed over his, his offering and decided eventually to go with Paul Anka, who interpreted the song, and it ended up becoming My Way by Frank Sinatra. Well, Bowie hears My Way by Sinatra, and he's like, come on now, that was supposed to be my song. And so he ends up writing his own version of it, just starting from scratch and writing his own version of that song. And so what we're gonna do today is really compare the two and, and just kind of live with these two pieces for a little bit and see how they are connected and where they differ. And to start us off, I have found a really interesting little snippet of an interview that David Bowie gave some years ago as he was talking about this specific um, convergence of these two songs and some of the history behind it. So let's hear David in his own words. Off we go. Inspired, I think it was more revenge. <laughs> Tell us. I mean, I wrote the song. I was with a, a music publishing company in the 60s, um, kind of trying to be a songwriter, not even a singer particularly, hmm. but I was quite happy to write them songs, and they would give these songs to different artists. That was the idea, anyway. Nothing ever came of it. I think, I think they got, like, three placed. And one of the things they gave me was this French song. And they said, do an English lyric to this. So I wrote this god-awful lyric. <laughs> Even a fool learns to love, it was called. It was dreadful. Even a god, fool so learns awful. to love. Really embarrassingly bad. And uh, 
I, I sang the lyric to the actual record that they sent me from France. <laughs> so you hear the actual, there's a tape of me, you can hear, it's on, it's, I, I've seen it on the internet, I mean, it's sort of, it's available. Um, you hear the French song in the background, you hear me singing my lyric over the top of it, it's very funny. Mm. They're funny man, don't let them down. Sounds like my way. I'll be The next time I heard it, it was My Way by Frank Sinatra. Hmm. What happened to my little... Oh, well, I'm sorry, but it wasn't very good, so we got Paul Anker to do it. So I, I was really pissed off. I thought, oh, that should have been my song. <laughs> I would be. So I thought, okay, I'll write my own version. And it was a huge hit, obviously. You know, so one of Frank's uh, biggest hits of his late career, right? Can you actually record something from the sessions? When and they go on and they talk about that. Uh, so uh, we'll leave that for now uh, <laughs> and, and, and move on. Uh, but it's fascinating, right? <clears throat> really, really, really interesting. So... Um, I want to take first a look at uh, some of Sinatra's version of this, and I'm not—we're not going to listen to Frank singing it. I'm sure y'all know that. Uh, I wanted to pull up a version, uh, uh, just a piano version that's got some score uh, underneath it, so we can take a look and see what's going on. So let's see a little bit of Frank's uh, version of "My Way," uh, a piano uh, cover of it. Off we go. So they're in D. Sorry, I won't sing. Sorry. <laughs> and it re racks for the next phrase. So that's a whole way through the four phrase uh, melody, right? So it's going to repeat D down to F sharp over C sharp. And then, yeah, so let's stop there. So you've got the D chord, right? Which is our one chord. It goes down in the second phrase to let's take a look at the inventory of notes that we've got there. We've got an F sharp and we've got an A and we've got C sharps and we've got E naturals. That would be the F sharp minor seventh chord, right? And it's over C sharp in the bass. So we're having the descending bass line. And it's the three chord, which is a nebulous sort of chord. Once you go to the three chord, you can kind of really go anywhere. It can act like a, a tonic, which it's doing here. And it can also act like a dominant, which it's not doing here. Uh, they move then to the next measure, and the, really the only thing that changes, the melody's the same, the, the, everything up here is basically the same, it's just that the note in the bass moves down by a half step. So now we've got an F-sharp chord, an F-sharp 7 chord, but it's half diminished instead of minor, with that fifth of the chord, the C-sharp, moving down to a C natural, right? So now we've started, we're starting to get uh, some chromaticism. And this half diminished type of chord can be a dominant function chord, but I don't think it's doing that here. It's acting as a chromatic predominant. I think it's acting almost like a two chord in a minor key. If this is F sharp, half diminished, then the next measure is a B chord. Well, that would be two to five. If B is five, then E is one, and that's where it ends up going. To E minor and it re racks. So for it, it goes from D down to C sharp, then the C natural down to B, and then that B then uh, vaults us up into the next phrase. And we land on the two chord, but it's almost like we're in that key for a split second. There, there's not much difference between E minor as a collection and D major as a collection, it's just the difference of the C sharp and the C natural, 
right? So we've got, uh, we land on this E now, and then we've got E minor. It goes, again, down by step in the bass. Now we've got E minor over D. And then, ah, there's the C sharp comes back. And then we're kind of moving back into D major there. So that ends up like a five chord. Back to D, right? And then we start the third phrase. Oh, there, fun stuff. To a G add nine. Woo! I wanna back up a little bit, cause it's, it's really, really great. So if I go here, So we land on, uh, as we start this next phrase, a D, and then we go, we end up with a D7 chord. If I back up a little bit more, maybe I can find that. Yeah, here, so here's the D, and then here's changing that C sharp to a C natural. So that D chord uh, is still D major, but now the seventh of that chord is not a C sharp, it's a C natural. And again, we're borrowing from a different key. So that D chord ends up being like five, seven of the four. It goes to G, the fourth of this particular key. There is an E flat that gets thrown in here for color. Uh, it's it's a minor ninth of that, of that uh, D chord, that D dominant seventh chord. It just adds a little bit of spice to it. So that D we would expect to move to G, and it does, it does there. Even though that the melody notes on an A, it ends up being an added ninth of this G chord, all in through there, it's 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 all uh, implying G. When we get to here, now, that's that's doing some fun stuff. We go down to E, and it's E half diminished. It's an E, a G natural, a B flat, and a D. Those are the four pitches that are in that particular chord. And we've got this little 4-3 suspension over the top of it. And by 4-3, I mean intervals. The A over that E is a fourth, and it resolves into a consonant third over that E. And so we get, actually, uh, that's a pretty um, uh, well-utilized melodic contour in, in Frank's version here. And so we get E as uh, an altered two chord, this two half diminished seven, and then it goes to this A here. D over A as an expanded dominant. There's the A7. And then it's a one chord, but E over the top of it that all resolves down into the D chord. And then he goes off into the next section, right? Hmm. just wonderful it's mainly using similar chords but the vocal part the melody gets higher into the vocalists range and increases the intensity and then by the time we end it's ending way up in the higher part of his uh, range that high ray over do right it's a little bit of that one and it goes back to uh, the soft part of it so let's move to David Bowie's version instead. And um, it's, <laughs> as I was looking for uh, a score that I could share of David Bowie's uh, piece, the one that I found, and I, I found it several places on the internet, um, it looks like uh, like this here. And it's it's published in with two flats, this is a really uh, not great score. I found some some uh, some problems with this one, but it's available and it's what we've got and it'll work for us, right? Um, it, I don't know why they're publishing that with with two flats if he's in F, but uh, yes, they shouldn't have to have to add <laughs> the uh, the E natural here because it should just be part of the F major uh, scale. I digress. The thing that I found really weird. Uh, before we really dive into this was uh, when I listened to it on uh, the fan favorites, I use this version that I've got here and it's the classic original uh, uh, video, right? So if I start this and uh, it starts in, maybe, 
be. There it goes. It's a god awful small affair. I don't hear that in F. I hear that in E. It's actually, to me, it's between. It's sharp. It's like it's between E and F. But it, uh, all of the, the sheet music that I've found for this is published in F. Now, here's the weird thing. If I go to the 2016 mix of Life on Mars from David Bowie that's available on YouTube, and I click play, listen to this. It's pitched up it's a God of in a F. Small affair. To the girl with the mousy hair. Isn't that weird? But her mommy is yelling no. And her daddy has told her to it's go. It's still on. I mean, it's put out by but David Bowie's official YouTube seen. Uh, now she channel. Through her but this 2016 version sounds like that, while the original version the with the mousy hair. is down by like a quarter tone, but like a three quarter tone. Daddy has told her to go. I find that weird. And I don't know if it was originally performed in F now and then just pitched down because of how it got recorded to, to tape or the on the reel. View. I'm not sure. Or if they took the original the and just screen. raised it a bit for the re remaster. Don't no, no idea. Really strange, I think. But um for our purposes, I'm going to rewind that one, and we're not going to listen to the newer one because I just think it sounds strange to me. Uh, it, I, as little as I know about this piece, the original version sounds right, and somehow that remastered version doesn't. And even though it matches more closely what's going to be in our score... That being said, I'm going to be listening to this and then reacting to it as if it was in F, okay? So if any of you have perfect pitch, uh, apologies. Uh, but uh, I'm going to react to this uh, given the, um, the notation that I, that's available. So as we move in here, let's just listen to a little bit of it. As we start, he's in F where Frank's was in D. You'll notice a similar chromatic scale going down, racks to the two, still going down to the five. And the daddy has told her to go. One. But her friend is nowhere to be seen. Now she walks through her sunken dream to the seat with the clearest view. And she's hooked to the silver screen. That's where it really departs. But the film is a sad thing for from um, my but way. She's lived it ten times or more. She could spit in the eyes of fools. If they ask her to focus on the scene, fighting in the dance hall. Right, like even like in through here, um, this is part of the problem uh, or one of the problems that I found in this particular score. They've got D flats in this particular chord in the piano, but the Ds that he's singing are D naturals. And it's written or, or uh, implied that it's G flat augmented, which would mean that they're implying that there's D naturals being sung. And the D natural is correct. So these D flats that are in that chord should not be there. Right, so let's back up a little bit and see what's what's doing uh, with David in this. And I'm going to use a um, I'm going to go back to Frank's version of this and uh, and try to show you, even though these are in different keys, how the underlying Roman numerals, the harmonies, are pretty similar. The melody is a little bit different but uh, the harmonies are pretty darn close. We start with the one chord, a one chord in F, a one chord in D, right? So this uh, measure corresponds with, the f um, with this measure as it starts, right? So one, and then this is a three chord, A minor, right? Over its fifth. Well, this was F sharp minor over its fifth. The three chord, the three chord. Right, and then uh, as we go forward a little bit uh, on face, as that C sharp drops to C natural, it now becomes 
the the f sharp half diminished well this becomes uh, a half diminished based on the three of the key it becomes a half diminished chord based on the three of the key it becomes a half diminished chord over its fifth both the exact same thing moves to the sixth chord a major sixth chord it's five of two right moves to the sixth chord and d the sixth chord is b it becomes major with that d sharp and it's five of two and guess where it goes two guess where this goes two they do the exact same thing harmonically and then once they uh land on uh e here that's the the two chord let's see down by step down by step five one right so as we do this down here we we land on the two it goes down by step and then that's the five the five and the one it's the exact same progression and uh, we end up then doing this again for the second uh, time through it's it's at this little spot where David kind of takes uh, the original version uh, that uh, Paul Anka did and departs from it and and it's a really smart departure I think uh, what he's doing here <clears throat> so I'm gonna see where we are in David's version to the silver screen there yeah, the right. film is found the right spot I'm gonna back up daddy has told her to go but her friend is nowhere to be seen There's that. Now she walks through her sunken dream Up to the two To the seat with the clearest view Five And she's hooked to the then, silver screen Just, just goes right to it. So they've got this listed as A flat over E flat. They're correct, right? So the bass goes down to E flat, right? So if I'm thinking about this in F, that's that's lowered seven, right? And the A flat chord is flat three. So he's gone completely. This should go to an F chord. C7, C7 should go to an F chord. There is no F there. But the, uh, the F chord has an F and an A and a C in it, right? Well, the this chord has an A in it. We've just changed it from A to A flat. It also has a C in it, which is unchanged. An F chord with the seventh would have an E in it or an E flat. And this one goes to E flat. So it's not completely out of left field but it's a type of modal mixture where he's gone to a chord that resides in f's minor key and in, uh, i don't think that he's gone straight to f minor he's just doing something uh different and what i think he's doing as a general idea is taking that initial descending chromatic line in the bass and he flips it around and now it's going to be an ascending chromatic line in the bass and i think that's the basic um yin and yang of how uh david put this phrase together well i was going down like this and that has a certain direction to it uh what if i want to um impart a completely different point of view if something changes uh, in the point of view of my lyrics and I think that that happens and musically it's really fascinating so we go down to this E flat and this we're going up now by half steps they've uh, listed this as E augmented um, yeah uh, I think of it as A flat augmented um, which basically is the same notes right if this G sharp is an A flat right if he's singing this it looks like if that was rewritten as an A flat, which I think it should be, then he's just that that's diatonic in A flat, right? Uh, except for what happens is if you had an A flat and then a C and then uh, your E natural, that becomes an, the augmented fifth of that particular chord. I think that both of those are really based in A flat. As the E flat moves up, then it's an E natural, and then that resolves to F. We get a F minor here, which is a very similar chord to A flat major, uh, where we were, and the melody can really be similar. Da da dee da 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 dee da 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 Right? And then it just skips up to this note. As we go from E flat up to E natural, up to F, up to G flat, really interesting spot and then down to a note under where we started and while the while the melody continues to get higher and higher and higher 
and we're doing something similar here. The D flat chord uh, then moves up, and I still think of this the same way as, as up here, that I thought of that not as E augmented, but as A flat augmented. I think of this one as D flat augmented, with D flat and F and A natural. Right, so this A down here becomes the f the fifth, the augmented fifth of that particular chord, and I almost think that, uh, and we could see this as it's relating. I this might be the bass might even be wrong here. Uh, I wonder if it moves up to A flat, and so it allows them to continue moving from E flat to E to F to G flat up to A flat in the bass up to A natural and then another half step to B flat and then this I know is wrong the bass note in this measure is a C flat um, and then that resolves down by half step into B flat where he does where he puts the chorus and the chorus is at the area of the four based on where we've been that's a lot of 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 words <laughs> to say with all this let's listen a little bit i'm going to back up a little more and i'll see if i can narrate it as we go this scene now she walks through her sunken dream up to two to the seat with the clearest view it sets up five and she's hooked but it's going to deceptively resolve there's the bass but the film is a sad voice She's I wonder that does go down to D flat. She could the and, then eyes of B flat. and then C flat is in there and goes down to B flat. Four, six, flat six to five. And I say those um, Roman numerals because, in my opinion, as he gets to the chorus, he modulates to B flat. Right, so we got uh, sailors, and then there's the four chord, the E flat, and then we go up to six, which has that same uh, B, high do, the B flat in it, and then we get this G minor chord, this G B flat and D, that then gets the G lowered by a half step. So now we have G flat, B flat, and D natural, right? And that's what that G flat augmented uh, is like, and it just goes from the six. And we just keep the chord exactly the same. We just drop the root by a half step from G to G flat. And then it goes down to F and it sets up this dominant. But he doesn't give us the, you know, it changes, right? It's that F should be dominant to B flat. But no, he gives us these other three chords first before he gets us back to B flat major. He changes that F to F minor, bringing back that A flat. And then we get a fun little C minor, um, a beautiful uh, C minor chord. That's the two, and then the four, and then four goes to one there. Uh, let's see. It's a freaky show. Four. Take a look at the long tail. Meeting on the wrong guy. Oh, well. Wonder if you never know. Right. Is a minor F. Is there life on Mars? Same thing. And that is also a problem because that is not an E flat minor seventh chord. That it's an E minor seventh chord. It's actually E half diminished. And as he sets up life on Mars, and we land on the the minor chord of that key, the sixth chord, he goes down to flat six to five and then to it's it's chromatically moving bass lines which is a major staple of both of these songs chromatically descending bass lines and when he gets to the e natural that's a natural uh way for that e then to move back and tonicize f as moving us back to our home key little raise motion to four to minor four major one and we're back to the beginning now the workers have struck for fame because Lennon's on sale again see the mice in their million hordes 
been five from two to two. We'll pretend you is out of bounds. It's a beautiful structure. To my mother, my dog, and clowns. But the oh. film is a sad thing, ball. Because oh. I wrote it That's ten sequential. times or more. Does it again. It's oh. about to be written again. Then C flat goes down by half step and we're B flat. And the way that that actually works, this D flat over C flat, right? It's a, it's almost like a, uh, it's a D flat dominant seventh chord, right? D flat, F, A flat, and C flat, right? We don't even get the C. Do we get the C flat in the chord? We don't even get to. We don't even hear it. Or, or look at it and what's there, but we definitely hear it in the chord. And that's a dominant function chord. It's a D flat dominant seventh chord. And D flat is dominant to G flat. It's not where he goes, right? He's move, He's using it as sort of an altered dominant. It should be an F chord that goes to B flat, but he's using this really fun uh, chord that's got that seventh in the bass and that seventh, that C flat is gonna resolve down by step. Uh, uh, especially if we're going to where it normally would go to G flat, that seventh, that C flat would resolve down by half step to B flat, um, melodically. And that motion then really proves a move to B flat. And it's f a fun cross relation of that D, sh uh, that, sorry, that D flat moving to D natural. And it's a really bright arrival point. And it can only really be that bright because of how dark he's gone to flats before he gets there. It's really, really fun. Great way to add an augmented chord into your music. Take a stable chord and just drop the root by a half step. want to see what no nothing left well how about that friends how about that um i never knew how closely connected these two songs were um before doing the fan favorites uh just just a few weeks ago uh sinatra uh, sinatra's version lyrically uh, th this is another part where another uh, way that they're connected, but really quite different in their interpretations. Um, Frank's uh, version, My Way, is sort of this anthem of self-determination. It's, boy, if anything is, a, is quintessentially American, it's My Way by Frank Sinatra. Nothing else matters except for living life on your own terms. He's... Um, the character in that song is is looking back on his life and what he's done and for the most part he's really satisfied with himself he's held nothing back he wasn't shy he didn't compromise his personal beliefs or his principles and his sense of self and he has attained success in this life he's his own man he's he's an artist you know and uh bowie's version uh is not an anthem of self-determination it's a self it's an anthem of self-realization to me uh the, the character in bowie's song is a girl that's sort of rejected by society her parents for her ideas as she reflects upon her 
life circumstances, and she is disgusted enough uh, to, with all of it to start uh, dreaming of escaping the superficiality of the world that she sees, and she starts looking towards Mars, and maybe that's a good place to go. Is, is there life on Mars? Is there life on Mars? You know, it's a, and that's why the question mark is in the, um, in the title. Um, you know, Frank's version uh, is, pers uh, is personifying uh, the person that uh, gains success in, in this life by ignoring uh, occasional social norms and, you know, doing it his own way. Uh, and meanwhile, the girl in Bowie's version personifies all of those in society that live in this world of what they consider superficial uh, art um, from people that keep churning out cheap knockoff stories and songs about the same old boring shit. <laughs> Both protagonists know, I think, what's being peddled to society is largely BS. I think both of them know that. Uh, and sometimes there's value and sometimes there's not. Uh, while Sinatra's character revels in his own success within that paradigm, Bowie's character is sickened and repulsed by it. And both songs are built from the same source material. It's so much fun just to, to, to consider the different points of view of art. You know, this uh, existence and understanding of both of these songs, for me, enhances uh, both of their statuses in popular music as, um, you know, and music culture as important and landmark uh, pieces. Pieces of art, uh, just general songs. And the fact that they're both sort of based on this you know, what does it mean to have art in the world? Like, I did it. I did it my way, and, and y'all ain't going to stop me. And Americans are like, yeah, all right. And Bowie's like, is there really any point to all of this? And is aren't we just churning up the same old stories? It's boring, and is there just nothing left for us to understand and have realization to? And we're like, that too. And <laughs> we like both of them. And it's just one of these odd convergences of artists uh, in the late 60s and early 70s that uh, that came together and we get these two inextricably linked pieces of uh, Life on Mars by David Bowie, uh, Bowie and My Way by Frank Sinatra. I never knew that uh, these songs were connected in this way and um, when I heard it for fan favorites uh, and really dove into it a couple weeks ago, I was surprised by how uh, how um, complicated and sophisticated the um, the harmonies uh, in David's piece were, and, it, and I wanted another shot at it. And so I am thankful for the opportunity to dive into Life on Mars and give it a little bit more context for all of you. I am happy that you have been here with me, and uh, we're going to come back with some more stuff uh, later on in the Behind the Score series, but this is all for today. Thank you all for your support, and we will see you all next time on another edition of The Daily Doug. <laughs>